Hello, everybody. Welcome to the virtual California theater. Once again, here with CineQuest 2021 coverage. And I am talking this evening with director, writer, Peter Shea, with his new film at CineQuest called Drive All Night. Uh, Peter, welcome. Thanks for joining me and Glad having this conversation. Yeah. And, um, for those who go regionally, this is a San Jose set film. And uh, people know that I, I used to be a San Jose resident. So you made me very ho homesick for uh, San Jose and and all the community around. You actually made Santa, San Jose seem a little more uh, edgy and darker than I feel like it actually is with this Definitely. with this movie. So I'll let you describe it. What you know? What is Drive All Night? What's your elevator pitch for this film? All right, so Drive All Night is a surreal fever dream neo-noir about a taxi driver who picks up a mysterious stranger who makes him drive around the city while being chased by this ominous kind of hitman person. And the further along we go into the film, the more surreal it becomes. Yeah, and you it's interesting. You, you went ahead and said the hitman person, which he is a hitman, but he also looked very much like to me, the video game character, right. Hitman. And this is a fever dream, but it seems to center on, uh, I don't know what you call them, game bar, uh, is it right. called mini boss, which actually is in San Jose. I don't know. If, definitely. I don't know if it's still open, but um, you've definitely put this around a, a huge video game motif. So, definitely. you know, what, what drove you to create this, to take this approach towards this, as you say, neo-noir. I love that name, that title for a genre. Right. I wanted to, it to feel like almost like a retro gaming experience, right? With different levels and different progressions and almost like mini boss characters within each one. Um, and then to give it kind of like, almost like a cyclical narrative, like you're stuck inside of a, one of those high score games you can't really get out of, you know? So... Yes, and, and and your female protagonist knows an awful lot about gaming history. So, right. you know, if nothing else, you will walk out of this movie, uh, walk away from this film, I guess, because you can't say walk out. We're not in theaters. Um, but, but uh, you know, having learned a lot of interesting little backstory trivia about uh, right. th this really arcane game knowledge, is, is it's fascinating. Uh, and you also uh, created... Uh, a game with it so on right on the apple store and on google play you right. can get the drive all night experience so let's talk about that what what drove you to do this parallel gaming uh, definitely so my executive producer sam cho him and i uh, we've known each other for a long time but like a few years ago i worked with him on like an independent uh, mobile game called Rift Legion War for his independent game studio. Um, I did a lot of the writing, story crafting, kind of like creative direction part of it, whereas him and Jonathan Q, one of my other producers, did a lot of the back end, front end coding, all the technical hard stuff, right? And uh, so while kind of pitching him drive all night right um because he's also one of the investors um we talked about the possibility of creating like a transmedia experience for viewers by having a mobile game that's explores not only the world of the game but kind of different possibilities in a more uh in a different medium that we can't quite you know do in a movie yeah, you it definitely it fills in. I guess it's not quite backstory, but but there's implications of these scenes in the film right. that don't actually get get made, uh, get shown in the film, and the game has them play out. And it, it's a it's a fun little piece. I, I did. Uh, anybody cool. who follows Fanboy Planet knows uh, I consider myself a fairly lame gamer. But uh, I at least managed to stumble through and 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 enjoy the, the the you know get the mechanics pretty fairly easily, and it was interesting seeing the different locations. Uh, I think you took a swipe at Funko, just just a light parody, and <laughs> right, I really right. like. Dang it! I would have loved to have seen that, but that's probably a budgetary issue. Um, <laughs> is, sure. But but let us talk about since this normally in a in a regular year, and we do hope that in August, Cinequest will have an in person component. Oh, for sure. Um, 
you know, it's rare that CineQuest actually gets to have a film that is about, you know, if you were at the California Theater, you could walk out and be in some of the settings of Drive right. All Night. So, uh, you know, what what was your process in, in securing locations and being in San Jose, which used to have a film commission, doesn't now, but, right. you know, it's definitely, if you know San Jose, this is downtown San Jose. It's fantastic. Definitely. Yeah. I mean... So I think it goes back to how I wrote Drive All Night. I was living in San Jose in around like 2015 when I wrote a lot of Drive All Night. And I had like pretty bad insomnia then um, writing one of my other scripts and, you know, working at the time. And so I would go on night drives through the city. And I think the route I took most was probably down Santa Clara Street to 10th Street back down like Williams and San Carlos and then Santa Clara, right? In weird circles. And uh, I think that's what kind of spurned spurned the thing. And, uh, you know, having lived in San Jose, there's a lot of cool places that, you know, you've never really seen in a film, right? Um, so I wanted to show showcase some of those places. Um, and uh, I think the arcade bar, especially the cool story behind that, it, was, it wasn't built when I wrote the place. But uh, they grand opened, I think, a few months before principal photography. And so George, uh, one of the uh, co-owners, he he owns another bar downtown. I think it's Paper Planes or Original Gravity. Um, oh, so yeah. Been there. yeah. Yeah. So I, I've, I've gone the, the, to those bars a few times. So I got in contact with George. We talked about it. And um, they, they were, like, super cool about it and let us uh, shoot there. So we did a few of our overnight shoots on location there. You also had, I mean, I, I should say, a, a fever dream. There was a, a lot of uh, of uh, drive all night that felt a little, uh, felt a lot Lint, like David Lynch. You know, like yeah. I wasn't quite sure, but I realized that was the elliptical. <laughs> I got the video game thing, um, and there is one uh, or recurring sequence of midnight. I'm sorry, remind me of the character. Uh, the midnight singer. Judy. Midnight Judy, and uh, it's actually at, and, and it's funny, uh, so you and I have both worked at a theater company called City Lights, and mm -hmm. City Lights has done some stuff uh, early on with Fanboy Planet, and so you know, I recognized, wait a minute, Midnight Judy is singing on the stage of the Kit Kat <laughs> Club, yeah. and and I just texted my friend Ron Gasparinetti and said, wait a minute, was that your cabaret set? It must have been your cabaret set. <laughs> So yeah. I mean, it was really cool. How fortuitous was that for you? I mean, it's just oh, like you very, found the perfect fits. Very, because I was I've been looking around for like a jazz club like that for for a while, but never really finding one, right? And I didn't want to have to travel like too far because that'll you know eat into my shooting day budget, etc. And coincidentally, City Lights was doing cabaret, and uh, and I've done plays there in in the past. They've like done like readings. Um, this mm -hmm. was. 2012 2013 i think um and so i i knew i knew ron and, and lisa Millet at the company and so i contacted ron and uh yeah he, he let me shoot there and it was just like the the perfect set in that the colors matched the tone matched you know the uh the lighting in there looked cool and uh because it was a theater um we were able to kind of do some more complex lighting rigs um, that we wouldn't have to been able to do at an actual jazz club, or maybe it'll be a lot harder. Yeah, it just it, it there just seemed perfect. So let's talk about your 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 playwriting. I mean, you, as you you mentioned right before we started recording, you've moved to New York, and I will assume part of that is because that's where the playwrights, you know, need need to go. Right, that's where right. the American theater really is. Kind of, you know, even still. Hopefully, in a few months, come back up, and Hopefully, you know yeah. there's a lot of vibrant independent uh, theater as well. But uh, you know, you you are a screenwriter, but also you know you got your start as a playwright. So let's, let's talk yeah, about that and with Asian American theater companies as well, and, and bringing that voice. Right. Um, yeah, I started writing plays uh, probably like 11 years ago, kind of uh, when I was in college, and. I think it's it's great because with playwriting you almost get to see your work done a little faster you don't need quite the the budget and it's you know writer to actor really an actor's medium at the you know the final product what you see on stage and uh i think also rehearsing my plays is kind of a vehicle for which i i also get to rewrite you know you know after the show's done i guess um kind of, you know, seeing it live from beginning to end rather than in a film where you're shooting at a sequence. 
And then um, I've worked with like, you know, local Bay Area theaters, I think San Jose Reps Emerging Artists Lab, uh, West Valley College, uh, City Lights, you know, Asian American Theater Company in San Francisco. And then um, I think around 2013, I started getting my works kind of out of state, uh, Chicago, you know, New York, Ohio, a few, a few other places. And I know there's like a, a several theaters that I work with in, that I've been working with in New York, um, Nylon Fusion and T. Schreiber, as well as the GI-60, which is at Brooklyn College that I really enjoyed working at. Um, and so I think part of it was I moved to New York for that reason, but also, you know, I figure this is probably the only chance I get, or at least the easiest for me to, to move to New York. But, um, you know, who knows? I think I'll probably end up in LA or bouncing around. So I'm afraid anybody that's been in California and works in entertainment eventually must yeah. come here. <laughs> yeah. For sure. It impressed me, but go to but go to New York while you can. Abs absolutely. Um, you know, so I mean, so you've done plays, you yeah, and, and you've worked in video games, and then in this film, um, you know, especially I, I I do have a question that I that I may you know reach out to you and come back in, in months from now and have a, a more of a conversation about uh, yeah, about about, about this multimedia, this transmedia as as you call it, and I I. Mm -hmm. That, that, that is true you know do you find a particular challenge or what or is it really a blessing in being able to say okay you're writing this this screenplay i can't tell it with the budget i have i can't tell this part right. and then you go oh but we could just animate it over here in this game and you know i don't know how how you know what what kind of challenge right. what kind of difference was there where you like you know slicing things out and going, that'll go for the game yeah, definitely. I think I'll start with the challenges first. Obviously, I think the the biggest one is like kind of the technical leap between the two. With film, there's definitely a lot of the technical aspects that um, luckily, you know, I had a great team of, you know, sound designer, score, cinematographer, lighting team, you know, great crew, right? That they were able to take the technical parts of it and really execute it really well on film, especially for, for kind of the sty really stylistic vision I had. And with the video game, there, there comes a whole new set of technical stuff, you know, the the coding, you know, the design work, the, the art, which I have no idea how to do, except I want, you know, things to look a certain way, I suppose. Um, in both cases, I think the, now the part that's really rewarding is then you really get to, to write how, how you want to without thinking of, can we do this in a film, you know, within a low budget film or how, how can this translate to, to a game, right? So it's, it's kind of like, you're you're able to do do both in a sense because in a, in a video game there there's a, a different narrative where you know you're controlling a character you're maybe hacking slashing the way through so it's a completely different experience you're trying to trying to um create for the the consumer whereas with with film it's you're it's a more of a director editor's medium where you say hey um i want you to look at this and this is where we cut it right um you know, so there's less exploration going on in, in the sense of, you know, in video games. But yeah, like, you know, I think work having worked in theater before and then jumping to film, I think, made it more comfortable for me to jump between the mediums, for sure. Okay. And and your driver, character. let's not uh, give short shrift to your actors. You know, he's, he's uh, it's interesting as you, uh, I think that the press materials refer to this as kind of the down the rabbit hole. And he does seem to some extent passive, but so, but quietly noble, you know, is, is there, right. is there some of Peter, as you say, you were driving around because you couldn't sleep. Is, is there, how much of Peter Shea is in your driver? Um, I don't know. I, I would say I wanted him to be like a moral center, right? A very grounded person and i think there's probably a, a part of me that wants to be more like my taxi driver character dave but i think he's a, a much nicer guy than i am probably <laughs> um yeah i don't know i i think like in the arcade scene he, he doesn't drink he just drinks water i think i probably would have would have gone for for vodka or something um it would be a different movie. That's all I got to say. <laughs> but yeah, he's a lot more or stoic and he's, uh, 
he's not really proactive. He's almost like reactive, kind of like a dreamer, kind of going mm -hmm. through the motions of a dream, right? It's like the way I imagine it is he's, even though he's the driver, he's not the one driving. He's kind of taken for a ride, right? Whereas I can think in a lot of, a lot of times I tend to like to be the one who's in control directing the thing. Well, and you, and, and that, so you got the, and, and nice job with it. So, um, you. <laughs> no, it, it's it's an interesting film. It, it's uh, Mike Rabel was on. We did a podcast last week, and we were saying Very cool. that you know we it, that every year Cinequest has you know these midnight movies, and right now mid, the concept of a midnight movie is meaningless. You're not staying up you know right. till midnight to watch these you can watch from march 20th oh my gosh i forgot to put this on uh there we go uh <laughs> from march 20th to march 30th it's 3.99 per per mm -hmm. ticket uh to watch drive all night you can watch it anytime in that in those 10 days definitely. uh it doesn't have to be midnight but it definitely feels like a midnight movie and was that something right. you were going for that kind of you know yeah, this yeah yeah, I wanted to to have it almost be like a midnight movie with kind of like slasher movie references and the kind of like the 80s retro future B movie stuff, you know. I think a few of the films I, I really like, uh, one of them Turbo Kid that came out. Oh, yeah. That one, but that one, I, I really liked it. It was like a throwback to that. And obviously, you know, Blade Runner for me was also like a, a big inspiration aesthetically, you know, with like the dark gritty versus the colorful neon. And I, I definitely felt in your score, there was definitely a feeling of John Carpenter. Oh, definitely, and, yeah. You know, and so I, I, maybe some people watch this just, just perked up just for that, you know, because it, right. it, it definitely, it, it had that feeling. So, uh, yeah, so it's March 20th to March 30th. Um, again, you don't have to watch it at midnight, but it is definitely that kind of trippy. And yes, there's a nod, I'd say, to Lewis Carroll. I'm thinking a lot of filmmakers and storytellers in the 21st century don't give enough credit to Lewis Carroll because we're all going down yeah, the rabbit sure. hole. <laughs> and I've seen so many comparisons sure. to Wonderland, but uh, you know, so it, it was an enjoyable film. And and Peter, thank you for taking the time because I know it's it's later for you in yeah, New definitely. York. Oh, no uh, problem. And uh, you know, I'll reach out and we will have uh, conversations again in the future. So um, thank I'm you. Hoping and, to have a second film after this one. So I uh, hope so. Hope so. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Hello? Hi. I'd like to call a cab. You ever think about just leaving it all behind and running off into the sunset? You mean sunrise? Same difference. Yeah. Then what's stopping you? What's her story? Morgan? You got, like, history or something? It's complicated. What's complicated? Hello. When are you gonna come visit me? I could use a company. I need you to do something for me. There's a girl. Find her and bring her to me. They say vengeance rides a swift horse. That's why I need you to be faster. Let's go. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss out on any Fanboy Planet videos. And remember, use your powers for good.